Okay. Today we are coming uh, to you live from two different locations, California and Michigan. Uh, and what we want to do today is really talk about uh, medical school admissions. It's uh, one of the most complex, uh, difficult parts of the uh, admissions uh, world, to be honest, in terms of all the different secondaries, the primary, the AMCAS activity section, all the different things that are happening uh, in terms of uh, medical school and how many different uh, parts there are to the process. And to get us started and really to kind of help us out today, and this is really an exclusive uh, opportunity for us is that we're going to be meeting and talking to Nadine Jawad. She's uh, currently Right Tracks uh, College and uh, Medical School Admissions uh, Director. And she recently, and really why this really kind of uh, sparked this whole conversation, she recently was admitted to Stanford Medical School, Harvard Medical School, and UCLA Medical School, all together with over a million dollars uh, in scholarships. Really an incredible person. Um, and I want to quickly introduce her before we get started. Go ahead, Nadine. Hi everyone, I'm really excited uh, to be having this conversation. I know how helpful sometimes these free and accessible webinars can be to you all. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, my name is Nadine, I'm from Dearborn, Michigan. I uh, grew up my entire life in Michigan, uh, did my undergraduate studies at the University of Michigan um, until I left to study on the Rhodes Scholarship at uh, Oxford University. Um, so I've been abroad for the last two years and applied while abroad. Um, and I'm happy to, uh, that I committed to Stanford and uh, to have these great opportunities and figured it'd be helpful um, since you're all home to share some of these resources and ideas with you all via this webinar. Fantastic. And so what we're planning to do over the course of this really quick, I'm going to try to keep it really uh, short and to the point. The good news is I think both Nadine and I speak at about a million miles a minute. Uh, so we should be able to get through a lot of information quickly. Uh, but we're going to go through some of the key, key questions that really um, – how do I say, confused Nadine when she started this process about a year ago, and she has since been able to develop a lot of expertise really towards these questions and the whole process itself. And the uh, ultimate goal is that we want to be able to uh, pass this information on to you and then for you to pass this information uh, on to others who are interested in the medical school process. And we're going to have the exclusive opportunity uh, for a set number, a limited number of applicants to work directly with Nadine in their medical school admissions process. And so without further ado, I'm going to quickly fire off some questions for you, Nadine. And at the end, we'll show you exactly uh, what would be the next steps in being able to work with Nadine in your medical school applications. So the first question really for you, Nadine, to kind of kick it off is to ask, uh, where did you, where do you, where do you start with the admissions uh, process and the cycle? Like, how do you figure it all out? There's a lot of moving parts. So what do you uh, do and where do you start? Yeah. So <clears throat> the way that you apply to medical school is through um, the AMC AMCAS portal. And so if you just Google AMCAS or AMC application cycle, you'll find that information online and you have to start by creating a profile in there, putting in all your basic information and getting an AMCAS ID. Um, so this is really like if you apply to undergraduate uh, university in the U.S. and use the Common App, it's basically the same where it's one portal um, where you're going to be doing uh, the hub of your main primary work, if that makes sense. Right. And again, I'm just going to quickly showcase it right here. This is the portal that you would be using and here's where you would pretty much sign up. Now, here's a couple of quick things. As of the 27th, just today, uh, the transcripts are received. Uh, you know, things are basically getting processed. Uh, I believe, Nadine, correct me if I'm wrong, that the um, the application portal uh, opens so that they can start seeing the questions and so forth as early as uh, next week, I want to say. Is that correct? Yeah, and we're going to touch it later, but it's definitely important to get early bird um, and, and get involved in the process early. Yeah, so as soon as next week, you should be able to access that online. Um, I haven't read anything that says there should be a delay in opening the application for the upcoming year. So... Um, that's just something to know and keep in mind. Okay. <clears throat> and so from your perspective, what would make for a really good primary statement? It really is the beginning of your application. It's the whole process starts from the primary uh, the primary statement, so to speak, excuse me. And that primary statement then goes on to be able to get the universities to add request secondaries from you. So what would make for a really good primary statement? Yeah, so I think uh, based off the work that I've done in editing uh, personal statements for medical schools that I oftentimes see people have really good ideas, but then they forget um, that this personal statement is supposed to be about them and not about these ideas. So for example, you know, you could have, I remember my first draft, I talked a lot about my interest in inequities and social inequalities, but there wasn't enough about what I did to address those issues or even why I'm interested in those things. And so as I 
work through different drafts. I had to get more at me. And it can be difficult to talk about yourself sometimes, of course, but you really have to get the crux of why you're applying. Um, what, what is your story? What is your narrative? And what parts of you are trying, you are trying to show admissions committees? Um, I think the second piece to it is then figuring out what your narrative is. And so if you turn in a personal statement that tries to do too much, um, it, it's going to be confusing and hard to follow. And so you want to have a cohesive understanding of, you know, open up with, you know, well, you can, you, the, the structure is different and you have this slide as well on the anatomy of the personal statement, but you want to make sure that there is something cohesive and that you're, you're focusing on, you know, instead of a million things, one, one cohesive story for your application um, that makes you look like you're put together, if that makes sense. hundred percent. And again, you can see quickly here, we'll show this to you. We've shown it before. You get a basic sense of what you're looking for. This anatomy of a personal statement also blends in with and is in the same context because the um, the primary statement, I believe, is 650 words. So it's about two pages double spaced. You don't have all the wording in the world that you can put in there. So you have to be very parsimonious with what you use. But this is a good overview of uh, how to kind of develop and put together your uh, your personal statement. That section about section five right there about why that pro why that pro program excuse me why that school that wouldn't be necessary because again you're not applying to one particular school it's going to all the different schools. But again, it is important because even in that section section five is why you would really want to go to medical school and 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 so forth. So it definitely is something um, to be mindful of and keep it cohesive. Now, one other thing that I've noted and having done a lot of these personal st uh, primary statements myself is you don't wanna do a data dump of everything uh, in your primary statement. You have to recognize that there's gonna be a lot of secondaries and then the secondaries are gonna be asking you specific questions. If you do a data dump all into your primary and you have no more uh, experiences in your arsenal, then you've essentially gonna start creating duplicative material which can look bad for you. So you have to be very mindful of that. I mean, that's something I'm sure you were, uh, you were cognizant of when you were putting together your applications. Yeah, I mean, on the primary application, you have an activity section where you have a lot of opportunity to talk about the things you've done. And if you utilize your personal statement to put in all that background information, you're really taking away from what the story is of your personal statement. So just remember that you have other opportunities. Like Hamada said, you have the secondaries, but you also have the activity section. That's the resume part. And hopefully you'll have interviews too where people can ask you for elaboration. So el elaborating. So like you don't need to, to put everything on the personal statement up front. Got it. So as you see, we, we start talking about the secondaries. Tell me, how do you plan or how does one start attacking the secondary applications given the fact that you apply, you apply to how many schools yourself? Um, I applied to 17 schools. And on average, how many people, I mean, how many schools do people apply to on average? Would you yeah, say? Yeah, I mean, I've heard people say 30 to 40 schools um, right. and I've heard people say 10 and if I don't get into these 10, then I don't want to go because this is where I want to be. So it fluctuates. Um, and just bear in mind that there are uh, MCAS assistance programs for people who need us uh, financial assistance to apply because those can be costly in the process. So definitely reach out to MCAS, get a waiver if you're eligible. But um, yeah, so I applied to 17 schools. And what happens is after you submit your primary, um, typically you'll get a secondary from a majority of those schools. And what ends up happening is you have to have a strategy in mind. Um, so I, for me, it was a spreadsheet where I said, date received of the secondary, target goal for resubmitting it. Um, people do say, um, from what I've heard in different pre-med committees and admissions uh, talks that turning in a secondary within a week or two is prime. Um, it, again, it could, because if it's a rolling admissions people, then they're looking at your application sooner and then they're offering you an interview hopefully sooner. Um, but if, you know, I, with Stanford, I mean, to be honest, it took me about, a few, it took me a few weeks to get my secondary turned in. And so all I'm saying is that the strategy is understand when you got it, keep track, make sure you're checking your junk mail, regu regularly check your inbox for your secondary applications, list when you got it, list the deadline if there is one, and then put a target goal of when you want to get that turned around and just go one at a time. It feels very overwhelming. I remember it was the summer, beautiful weather. You're getting all these essays. Some schools had like very, very long and extensive secondaries that take a lot of time. But if you just see what you got first, prioritize, make sure you're following your spreadsheet and going day by day and setting goals, I think that's the best way to attack it. Yeah, and I think I, I when we when we put together these spreadsheets, uh, like like you were saying, Nadine, you want to have the school name, you want to have the location. I think you also want to put in there why you're interested in that school and just kind of keep tabs of that and keep that research popped in there. And then you want to have <clears throat> a list of all the secondary questions listed one after the other in that cell of that spreadsheet so that you don't lose track. And it also helps you 
to kind of see which schools have similar secondaries to others so that you can use some of the materials and as opposed to having to re constantly recreating the wheel. And then at the end, exactly like you said, when you plan to, when the deadline is and when you plan to submit it by. Obviously, if you are submitting it and start the process as of today and go all the way through to May or June, I mean, the application process is open till when? November, December. I mean, we've worked with applicants before that have gone as far as December, maybe even to January to submit their secondaries, which by then, as you said, most people have already been interviewed. A lot of positions in the class have already been taken. So you want to get on top of it as fast as possible, yeah, but you want to kind of be mindful of that whole scope of uh, other things, which obviously then leads to the next question, which is what is a timeline appropriate for those early birds and just for really the, for the strong applicants you mentioned uh, trying to get it done within two to three weeks. Yeah. Submit your primary or receive your secondary. What's a good timeline? Okay. So if you're listening to this and you haven't started your personal statement, we're not trying to panic you or stress you out. Um, obviously there's circumstances in the world right now that are prohibiting people's timelines. But um, I, I often say, and this was my own rule of thumb is when the application opens, aim to submit. So I think I turned in my application about a day after the primary um, application opened up. And then uh, that for me worked out well because then I was getting my secondaries early and getting those turned in early. Um, I think if you, the earlier the better, especially for schools that are rolling admissions, you wanna be in the top priority. Now, of course, if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, okay, like I have if you don't start early, but definitely early starts gets you ahead, gets those secondaries in. And I would say as soon as you get that primary application uh, made, uh, like the, the portal opened up and you have an MCAS ID, definitely work to get all the different parts submitted as soon as possible. So perfect, that means perfect is when you would start. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was going to say that means like next week is when you would, would aim to get those things um, rolling. So well, the idea here is that you should already be thinking about your primary statement probably as early as the early spring. So if you're just thinking about it now, you're a little bit behind the eight ball, at least for those early birds, those really strong applicants that want to get it out there. And of course, it's all kinds of issues happening right now with the people uh, who, are, who are banking on. And I think I remember, Nadine, you took the, uh, the MCAT. When did you take it? I want to say April, right? Yeah, actually, no, I moved it. So I ended up taking it because um, I had two gap years. So it was a little bit different for me, but I took mm -hmm. it in the fall of... Um, right before I started my master's program. Um, so you took it in the fall and then you applied the following April, May, June. Exactly, yeah. So I was uh, technically early in, in the sense that I had about eight months before I was actually applying to med school when I took the MCAT. Got it. And so I'm going to ask a quick side note, and I know we're going a little bit over the time I wanted, but this is such great information. Right now, people are, some people waited until April March, April uh, to take the MCAT. And obviously the MCATs have been canceled as of a lot of standardized tests have been canceled. What do people do now? I mean, if you haven't got an MCAT score, you're trying to be the early bird candidate, what are you doing? Yeah, so um, the, the good thing is you're not in, you're not alone. Um, there are a lot of like very, very strong applicants who have not had the chance to take the uh, MCAT yet, whether they were waiting to graduate or whatever it was uh, before Corona happened. Right. So I say like, look at the uh, university or the, the med school website and see what the med schools are allowing for in terms of delayed MCAT submission. I think I read that the University of Michigan, for example, actually, I don't want to misquote what they're saying, but they have an MCAT policy where they're letting you submit without your MCAT scores, which is different than what used to happen before. And so look into the schools that you're interested in applying to, make sure that you have that um, understanding of what they're allowing for and just be on top of it to, to make sure that you're not missing any opportunity to take the MCAT online, which is what I think is gonna happen with new um, AI, like there's a technology app that you download and they, they just watch you take the test from home. So just be at the forefront of following things. Um, I know there are different blogs, we'll have a blog, like there are different things going on um, with people chatting about this. So just stay, stay in touch. Okay. And then let's take a quick, uh, step back. The, we mentioned this before primary statement, activity section, secondaries, uh, interviews, the whole nine. So let's go back to stick a back notch to the activity section. Any tips on the activity section when you're putting that together? Yeah. So one thing that I didn't know, um, until someone told me when I was applying was it's good to put things that aren't just science related that you have a passion for because it really humanizes you as a person. Um, so for example, I listed a hobby. Um, I'm a big show goer. Uh, one of my best friends is, uh, she's a stage, uh, she does stage managing, stage directing in the theater. So I watch a lot of shows. Um, and when I lived in London, I spent a lot of time 
uh, going to the West End and watching French shows even off the West End. So in my hobby section, I made sure I listed the importance of um, like fiction and theater and my life and, and how that's something that I take a lot of time and spend a lot of time doing. And so that's just like a big tip that comes up top of my head because some people um, try to just only put shadowing or only put research and that really limits understanding of who you are as a person. Um, also, you can aggregate experiences. So I've seen people list multiple shadowing experiences over three different boxes, which doesn't really make sense in my opinion. My approach was to merge concepts. Um, so for example, when it came to the psychology lab that I worked in, all of my uh, poster presentations and publications were listed in that one box related to that activity. And I think that gives you space to then fill in other things and other interests that you have besides science that make you into the human that you are. Okay. Now, obviously you're a, uh, an amazing individual with a lot of energy and have done a lot of crazy stuff, but what do you tell those people that, uh, that don't have as much, let's say, research or publications or volunteer activities or crazy cool interests like you may have. What do you do that? What do you do to mitigate for those issues uh, in your activity section in your application? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that um, when it when what what happens is if you just look at the way you spent the last four to five years of your life, there are probably things that you didn't recognize you can write about that you could write about. So what I mean is that there are certain advocacy organizations, even political campaigns that I worked on that I never thought that would be relevant to me applying to med school. And so if you're looking at your statement, you're like, I, I don't, or you're looking at your um, list of activities and you're like, I can't, I don't know what to put here. You can pull away lessons from basically anything that you've done in your life, whether that's babysitting or taking care of someone in your family or, you know, playing sports, playing I am intramural sports, like all these different things do matter because again, they humanize you. And if it comes in the end of the day that you feel that you can't fill every activity, in my opinion, it's better to fill things up as full as possible and leave a couple blank as opposed to trying to just spread out and, and force yourself to fill in every single line. Exactly. And the main reason you have to think about why do medical schools want to see somebody who is, um, well-rounded and has a lot of uh, interesting experiences. And the real reason is you're gonna be dealing with humans as a doctor. So you wanna be able to be personable and be able to uh, showcase all the things that allow you to be relatable as an individual, uh, as a human being with, with your patients uh, when that comes to that time. And not somebody who's just scientifically focused because if that's the case, then you should just be applying for research-based either positions or research-based medical schools and not ones that really wanna see an eclectic, well-rounded individual. Any last, Pieces of advice uh, before we sign off? Um, I would just say get started, um, reach out, ask people for help, and definitely good luck in the process and stay updated with what's going on with COVID-19. Fantastic. And I quickly want to showcase your um, your flyer. We're going to be posting these a lot. Again, applications are open. Uh, we want to do our best to be able to support you and help you out uh, in that process. Again, You've been hearing it from Nadine, who got into three of the top five medical schools in the United States, earned over a million dollars in scholarships, uh, is currently a Rhodes Scholar, also was a Truman Scholar, uh, or received the Truman Scholarship as well, or won it. Uh, and she is going to be uh, attending Stanford Medical in the fall. So this is a great time uh, this summer to be able to use her experience and uh, be able to really get yourself way ahead of the curve and uh, as competitive as possible in the admissions process. So thank you for your time, Nadine. We really appreciate it. Uh, we will have more information coming out in the coming uh, days and weeks as the medical uh, school applications open up. And we look forward to helping you uh, here at Right Track Admissions. If you have any questions, email us, info at righttrackadmissions.com. And uh, we look forward to uh, working side by side with you on the process. Thank you so much again. Yeah, thank, for you. Thank, you. thank you. Yep, bye.